Welcome to the one o'clock Techno Manifesto's Visions of the Information Revolutionaries. All of you should probably be at the keynote now, but I'll try to be reasonably interesting and entertaining. I'm the co-author of Techno Manifesto's Visions of the Information Revolutionaries, the, uh, the book edition, um, which is that. We're Adam Bray, she's also here, but since I didn't print out notes, I'm gonna make up the speech. And so we have the speech now, there's the book, and which is really the thing that's actually good. And then there's also the website, uh, which is at technomanifestos.net, which has a lot of uh, interesting stuff and hopefully will be uh, uh, built up in the future. So let me just get started because we don't have that much time. So the, essentially the title of this talk and what the book is about and, and very much what this speech is about is the nature of computers uh, as it's been developed uh, over the last uh, kind of 50 years essentially over the, the age of computers which in large part starts with Alan Turing's 1937, uh, actually it's, it's just a straight mathematical paper uh, on computable numbers uh, with an application to the Enchendine problem uh, and we're going to try to get all the way up to 2001 here with uh, the Future of Ideas, uh, Lawrence Lessig, and all of these are remarkable documents written by uh, remarkable people. And so let's just get started. Alan Turing, 1912-1954, his, in 1937, so he was a very young man, a college student, he wrote this document that laid out the, what uh, we now call the Turing machine, and the, for the, the point of the speech, uh, what I'm going to focus on is that what he did was he saw human computers, uh, that's, that is like back in that time, computers were people who uh, did calculations, wrote calculations of like uh, figuring out square roots and stuff, all paper and pencil. And he figured out how to kind of translate that idea into what uh, the, a design for a computing machine. And, and that's now known as the Turing machine. And his essential realization was that the behavior of the computer, that is the human computer, at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and the state of mind at that moment. And what Turing did is he realized that that state of mind can be replaced by uh, a note of instructions that says, what do you do and what is the next note of instructions? And, and then you don't need uh, any intelligence, essentially. All you just need is a program. And that's the, the initial realization of what computers are. And as I said, I'm moving right through. So now we're skipping up 1945, as we may think. Vannevar Bush was one of the dominant figures in US science uh, all th throughout the, uh, actually both World War I and World War II. Uh, he, one of his greatest contributions was uh, he basically was the person who uh, set up the National Science Foundation uh, post-World War II, even though he had kind of a grander vision for it. But his speech for the information age it was the 1945 document, As We May Think, which was uh, published in Atlantic Monthly. And in it, he described how we're about to undergo this uh, information overload and he envisioned this machine called the MEMEX, um, which stood for a kind of memory index. And his idea was that instead of uh, arranging information hierarchically uh, in file cabinets or such, what you could do is you'd have a, computer, a computing device which, uh, with, that you could pull up uh, images, text, and such, and they'd all be linked together, uh, the associative thought as he said, and the idea is that it's based on human memory. The human mind operates by association. With one item in its grasp, it snaps instantly to the next that is suggested by the association of thoughts in accordance with some intricate web of trails carried by the cells of the brain. The speed of action, the intricacy of trails, the detail of mental pictures is awe-inspiring beyond all in nature. And not surprisingly, that sounds a lot like a description of the World Wide Web and his document, as we may think, directly inspired the people who uh, 50, 60 years later uh, gave us uh, the net, or not the net, but the web. And now 
Also at the same time, though, is when you get essentially the first real digital computers. Uh, Vannevar Bush was someone who uh, was an analog computer person, and he believed that the future of computing was in analog computing, but it really wasn't. It was in the digital computer. And one of the greatest figures in that was John von Neumann, who is uh, perhaps the, the dominant mathematician of the first half of the century and uh, revolutionized pretty much every single scientific field. Um, but he died young uh, from radiation cancer because uh, he liked watching the uh, nuclear explosions uh, that the Manhattan Project did. Uh, but his realization in terms of computers was uh, written up in the first draft of a report on the EDVAC. And his recognition was that, again, it's a, just as Bush modeled, uh, it was his idea of modeling computers after human memory was to, uh, in some sense, model computers after the way that the human nervous system worked. Uh, with various organs separated. You have your input-output organs, central processor, logical control, and uh, a large memory. And that is the design of pretty much every single computer still now, and it's known about von Neumann architecture. And so in 1945, he laid out the plan for really what is the computer today. And it, there's been very little change except for in some uh, advanced units, but and because before then they were uh, it was complicated. They were going down like all these parallel processing problems, uh, separating things. But his uh, realization was you just make the processing simple, make the command simple, and then have a big memory. And this is what he's saying: any device which is to carry out long and complicated sequences of operations, specifically of calculations, you just have your computer do thousands of calculations a second, or millions or billions now and must have a considerable memory. And then he describes the memory. And while it appeared that various parts of this memory have to perform functions which differ somewhat in their nature and considerably in their purpose, it is never less tempting to treat the entire memory as one organ. And that's one of the biggest realizations in designing computers, was that the difference between like an instruction and data is, in a, is a difference that we know, but a computer doesn't have to care about and the central processors or computers don't really care. You know, they, they'll shift to address, you can put an address, you can put, uh, you know, a number, you can add the two. Computer doesn't care. At the same time, you have your computers, but you also have the realization of what they can do and what their place is in society. And Norbert Wiener, uh, a, a similar prodigy of the same era, uh, and a, one of the most famously absent-minded professors at MIT uh, wrote in 1948 a, a book about, uh, essentially about what feedback mechanisms, and in particular about negative feedback mechanisms. Uh, a, a positive feedback loop is one in which you have an input and output, input goes in, and then the output amplifies that signal, and you get your, your feedback squeal, like if I stuck this microphone up to the speaker, that would be a positive feedback loop. And, but negative feedback loops are regulatory. Those are like thermostats. You, if it gets too hot, the air conditioner gets uh, turned on. If it gets too cold, the heater goes on. It regulates. And what that does is it allows uh, systems to essentially to survive in a, in a changing environment. And his recognition was that that is perhaps the, the real connection between uh, living creatures, humans, society, all of which survive through regulatory feedback, and the advanced mechanical devices that were being developed, and in particular the computer. Um, and the word cybernetics comes from the Greek uh, kubernetes there, uh, which means steersman, and it's also the same word that gave us governor and government, and uh, that it's that navigation is like what cybernetics is. The regulatory feedback is, is you're navigating through the path. You're, you, you're, you've got your hand on the tiller. And that, and that realization is just one of the things that goes on is, is that responsibility. Is that, so you have my thesis is that the physical functioning of the living individual and the operation of some of the newer communication machines are precisely parallel in their analogous attempts to control entropy through feedback. And that recognition that both, uh, that both 
humans, society, and computers are surviving by, uh, through regulatory feedback, uh, really inspired a whole generation of people. Uh, and it's what we have, why we have so many cyberpunk and cyberspace and all those things. It's, that's really what the root idea is there. Uh, 1950, Alan Turing comes back, writes Computer and Machinery Intelligence, which is more commonly known just as the Turing Test Paper, and it's, uh, it's a real fun to read because he has a, a very odd sense of humor. Um, and the, the Turing Test, uh, as some of you may know, or all of you, is uh, essentially, he, he started off the speech saying, uh, asking the question, can machines think? And he says, you know what, that's too hard because you have to know what is thinking, what is intelligence, and those are questions that we can argue about forever but never really know what the answer is. And he said, instead of saying that can computers think, you basically say, can computers act human enough that we think that they're human? Can, can we have a conversation with a computer um, and believe that it's a real person? And a lot of people say, well, that's not really a definition of intelligence and that's not what artificial intelligence is. And it's basically right, but on the other hand, uh, it's something that you can actually try to achieve. Um, and then his question, though, was how do you build, uh, how do you construct a, an intelligent machine? And his idea was instead of trying to build an intelligent machine from scratch, you follow the path that uh, people do, which is you kind of start off as a, uh, a child, and then you are given information and feedback and training and lessons, and you uh, become an adult. And Turing believed that at the end of the century, so I guess that's now, uh, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. And uh, it's, in some sense, I, it's, well, one's opinion of whether that's true or not uh, is an interesting question. And then this was his idea for child. This is instead of producing, trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? And only today are people, I mean, people have been trying to do that for a long time, but uh, only today, in fact, especially with like the, you know, the amazing computing process that we have now, people have been trying to do that. And one of the big lessons is, the big realization is that children learn a lot more than we think. Uh, because what we learn in school is really only the smallest amount of what makes us intelligent. Most of it's just in, in interacting with their environment and with other people. Let me skip. No. Okay. 1960, man-computer symbiosis. Now we've got computers. The last 10 years were spent in actually building computers. We've got digital computers. We have the transistor. We have machines that work. And J.C.R. Licklider was uh, a very soft-spoken but incredibly influential man because he essentially was the person who uh, got the ARPANET going, which ended up with the internet, and he had a, a, this dream of what he called the intergalactic network, and what he did is he funded, he was the, the first person to really do ARPA funding for computer science departments, and in fact with that funding founded uh, pretty much all of the first United States computer science departments were funded uh, through him, and he also got the network of researchers there, and force them to work together and uh, actually learn from each other. And his real belief was that computers could complement humans in the sense that humans are good at thinking fast, or not thinking fast, but coming up with compl complicated ideas. Let's see, does that have it? No. Complicated, humans can come up with complicated questions, but we're sloppy and we think slow. Computers, they're simple, but they're fast and they, you know, they do exactly what you're told. And so he really believed that this is at the same time, the ARPA, like, ARPA was created to uh, fund for the space race. Uh, NASA came a few months later and actually ended up getting most of ARPA's budget. But they were, the, they were space government, they were, it was government money for the space. And he believed that the space frontier was considerably less interesting and important than the cerebral frontier because the thing about space is that there's a lot of it, but it doesn't, it can't be changed. Whereas the kind of the cerebral frontier uh, is something that is literally without limit. Um, and his hope was that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and that the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought, 
and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. And again, that's the type of thing that to a degree has happened in, uh, in many ways has not. Um, but the whole goal of interface design is really one of the things that has led to that. And this person right here, Doug Engelbart, is probably, I mean, and I might be overstating things, but he probably is the person who's most responsible for uh, the modern interface, the modern way that we use computers, the idea of personal computers and network computers. And uh, because he, in 1962, and he actually had this idea and was trying to figure out a way to put together the idea of augmenting human intellect, the idea that computers, the best thing that they can do is extend our own abilities and essentially make us smarter, make us allow us to communicate better and think better. And he had kind of two central ideas, which were bootstrapping and coevolution. And bootstrapping is essentially with the kind of idea of picking up by your bootstraps, the idea that with computers especially, you can design your tools on your computer and then you use those tools to uh, design better tools. Like, uh, you, for example, you write a programming, you know, you write a programming language and you design the next better version of the programming language in that programming language. And you can do that with pretty much anything with computers because the tools are, are just bits and you can manipulate them like a kind of magic clay. And his idea of coevolution was actually one of the things that really uh, founded his uh, goals in infra interface design. I mean, he was the person who uh, essentially designed the, the mouse um, and like, well, we have a picture of what he looked like here uh, coming up. And then by augmenting human intellect, we mean increasing the capability of a man to approach a complex problem situation, to gain, gain comprehension to suit her particular needs, and to derive solutions to problems, which is, you know, what we kind of have today. And we spend great sums for disciplines aimed at understanding and harnessing nuclear power. Why not consider developing a discipline aimed at understanding and harnessing neural power? In the long run, the power of the human intellect is really the more important of the two. And the thing is to realize that this is 1962. This is before, this is when there are practically no computers around. And these few people who, and it was incredibly difficult for people like this to convince anybody even other scientists, that it really was worth investing in investigating computers. And so this is him in 1974, and he had basically a system like this set up uh, about seven or eight years beforehand where they've got, you know, it's, it's a personal computer there basically. You have your, uh, your mouse, he's got a, uh, a key set, a courting key set at the left, and um, his software, and the software had, let's see what it had, like win Windows, uh, there was uh, like networked email, there uh, did some text and graphics. It, I mean, it was essentially a modern system. And the, what happened was, is this was at uh, the Stanford Research Institute, and pretty much in the uh, 70s, all, all the, the people jumped ship to Xerox Park and were more famous there. Uh, in building kind of what we recognize as the personal computer, and then those people, then more people jump ship to Apple and such. And it's a, it's a pretty direct evolutionary trail. At the same time as Engelbart, we have Marshall McLuhan, who's this uh, kind of very crusty Canadian Catholic who kind of hates modern technology, but has a, because he hates it, he pays attention to it. And he wrote The Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man. And his, what this book is saying is it was a, a book about the history of media. In, in media meaning uh, like the printing press, uh, literature, that type of thing. And it, it, the printing press transformed society. It took a, an oral society and changed it into one in which you had these solid books. It created the concept of authorship. The, the concept of copyright, the idea that you, a, an idea is associated with a single person because before, uh, and that is, can be held in a, in a locked form and then distributed to the masses, that there's a, like a public common ideas that are shared by people. The idea of the nation all came from the printing press and the Gutenberg Galaxy runs through that and then talks about how electronic media is affecting a, 
an equally profound uh, transition. And what that is is that the new electronic interdependence, the, like the electronic global networks, recreate the world in the image of a global village. And you may have seen that phrase all over the place. And this is what it's referring to. It's the idea that when we have a global network, we're all, every idea, all our ideas are kind of instantly transmitted everywhere. And at the same time, all of our actions have instant global consequences. And he's not saying that that's a, uh, a great thing, that the global vision is, hooray, we're all living in a village. It's, this is the village that has, essentially, you know, it's, it, this could be a headhunter's village where, like, it's all tribal rumors and panics going at the same time, uh, as, as well as it could be having neighbors and friends uh, on all ends of the world. And then in 1964, he, kind of, he followed that up with Understanding no Media, The Extent is a Man, which uh, talks, kind of continues the story of Gutenberg Bali, a galaxy, and he talks about the media of the present and the future. And probably the most famous thing that he said in there was that the medium is the message, which is saying that if you want to understand uh, content, if you want to understand an idea, you have to pay attention to how it's being uh, told. And like, for example, in some sense, this speech is the same thing that's in the book, and it's the same thing that's on the website, um, and it's the same thing that's in the uh, exciting television series, which hasn't been made. But the, all those things, the, the, everybody will have a completely different memory of that. And I mean, like, in theory, if this is, you know, this is being taped. You watch the tape of this speech, watching the tape of this speech would be entirely different than sitting here in this audience. And your memory, and how it affects you would be completely different. And this understanding of like understanding media, understanding the interface is one of the things that people forget about computers pretty much all the time is that uh, what you, how you interact with it is perhaps the most important thing. And he also recognized that electro electromagnetic technology requires utter human docility and quiescence of meditation such as befits an organism that now wears its brain outside its skull and nerves outside its hide. One of the reasons that people like McLuhan in the 60s is because he wrote really strange quotes like this. And, but there's, there's usually a real idea behind them. And this is kind of an interesting way of looking at the world is that we're as much trapped by are and controlled by our, the electronic technology as it uh, assists us. It, it's in all technologies kind of extend and change our senses, and electronic technology, electronic media changes in sense exactly the way we think, and that means that there are profound consequences in the way that we build our machines. 1968, lick lighter come back. Now. Uh, the ARPANET is about to be built, and uh, you have Engelbart's projects now. So, like the, now, these people have actually seen what the future, of, you know, kind of the personal computer will be. And the big question is, is like who gets the advantage of all this intelligence amplification? And the, you know, it's, it's just asking the question for society: the impact will be good or bad, depending mainly on the question: will to be online be a privilege or a right, and I have the feeling that there's um, more than enough panels uh, this weekend that are talking about this issue, uh, what is it, 25 years later? I'm not really that good at math. Uh, 30? 35? 33? 34? 34. There we go. And 1968, same time, we have, like, society is changing, and it's like it is in ways that essentially Marshall McLuhan was talking about. And uh, Abby Hoffman, a kind of one of the great media activists, uh, you know, who did stuff all around the city, uh, was like, he really uh, drilled down the idea that with the change of electronic, uh, the change from the industrial age to the information age, like the, our concepts of work and leisure can change. It, work is competition. Work is was linked to productivity to serve the industrial revolution. We must separate the two. We must abolish work and all the drudgery it represents. And like with physical resources, you know, those are limited. We have to compete for them. But intellectual resources, only because we construct laws and we we construct we, we attach them to uh, kind of old world ways of thinking. Do they have to be uh, scarce in competitive resources, which is 
a sense, you know, there's a whole conflict of whether you, uh, you know, can copyright control an intellectual property. And then in 1971, uh, he wrote Steal This Book, which expanded on his idea of the free society, uh, which is both in, in kind of both ways. It's the idea that free in that you can kind of like just take stuff, which is not, not necessarily the uh, best thing, but it's also the idea that um, you should have freedom to uh, like basically live without uh, kind of the, the constructs of uh, the old world thinking. And still this book also talked about uh, his abilities of media manipulation, but then also his inability, even though he was a great, he could, you know, get the press to his press conferences and stuff, but to actually uh, distribute ideas, it talk, it's the control of the distribution. To talk about true freedom of the press, we must talk of the availability of the channels of communication that are designed to reach the entire population, or at least that segment of the population that might participate in such a dialogue. Freedom of the press belongs to those that own the distribution system. and. That's why, like the internet web is a great thing, but there, you know the the corporations that control the old world media are are trying as hard as possible to uh, move systems that you know start off free into uh, controlled distribution channels. And speaking of that, 1974, Computer Lib, uh, Ted Nelson. Uh, an iconoclast, I guess, would probably be the best way, best way of describing him. Uh, and he, he really believed in the idea of the, the computer for the masses, that everybody should have a computer, that computers aren't, shouldn't just be something that like the elite uh, hacker computer priests uh, get to understand and use. Um, and at the same time, he, he coined uh, the word hypertext. Uh, and so the first thing is it's imperative for many reasons that the appalling gap between pu the public and the computer must be closed. As this, and it's supposed to be the, as the saying goes, war is too important to be left to the generals. Um, and that's us right here. Uh, guardianship of the computer can no longer be kept to the priesthood. Or it, even more he was referring to like a academic and uh, corporate elites. But the idea that the, you know, the hobbyist uh, has a real place in the future of computing was one that he was very correct. And hypermedia point the way to freedom, which was, yeah, like more than, Vannevar Bush's idea for hypermedia systems was that it would allow like the scientist or the lawyer to be more effective. But Ted Nelson really recognized it as a mechanism for uh, uh, keeping democracy in the modern age. And maybe, even if we're lucky, uh, allowing democracy to reach new and more remarkable forms. Uh, at the same time, Alan Kay, who's someone who's, uh, he's, a, he's a young man who's inspired by all of these people, and he coined the term personal computer, and not just coined the term, but had a real vision for it. And uh, as his ideas was that if the computer is to be truly personal, adult and child users must be able to get it to perform useful activities without resorting to the services of an expert. I have real trouble with the word the. Um, uh, in, in other words, like another way of saying that is that simple tasks should be simple and complex tasks should be possible, which is another thing that he wrote uh, and then was picked up later by uh, people like Larry Wall. Uh, and it's, in some sense, it's, it, Though these ideas don't seem like that complicated, but you have to remember that at the time, this is not what people were using computers for. This is not how people were designing computers. And even today, you know, it's not, this is, does not exactly reflect a lot of, like, say, Microsoft's like, design philosophy. Um, and then the range of simulations, because you recognize that computers were, uh, the best way of thinking is that they are simulators. They, they allow you to create worlds. Um, they're modelers. The great thing about computers is not that they can process numbers quickly or that they can, you can build a big database. It's that you can explore potentialities. The range of simulations the computer can perform is bounded only by the limits of the human imagination. Although the personal computer can be guided in any direction we choose, the real sin would be to make it act like a machine. And that's what most people do with computers. 
1980 of Mindstorms by Seymour Papert, who with Marvin Minsky was one of the, essentially the founding members of the MIT AI lab. Um, and he worked with Minsky on, he, he was a uh, kind of a child psychologist essentially, and he worked with Minsky to explore how computers could help children to learn and at the same time watch children learning and to understand how to design better and, uh, and more intelligent computers to understand, like artificial intelligence, kind of the same idea that Alan Turing was discussing. And pa Papert was the man who uh, invented <coughs> Logo, and you can see him there with a, a turtle uh, looking kind of very 1970s. Um, and, you know, it's again just hammering those same ideas. There's a world of difference between what computers can do and what society will choose to do with them. Um, because there's a great, you know, his idea for the computers in schools, it was not rote learning and uh, running through tests, it was actually uh, letting children play and build and, and work with each other. Uh, computers can be carriers of powerful ideas and of the seeds of cultural change. They can help people form new relationships with knowledge that cut across the traditional lines that separate humanities from science and knowledge of self from both of these. And this idea that computers can actually break down barriers between technology, uh, science, and arts, between like what we, the, the traditional boundaries is the same recognition that Abby Hoffman was talking about, that Marshall McLuhan, the idea that the industrial revolution allowed us to live in a modern society, but the sacrifice that we made was that we compartmentalized our lives, like our jobs, like, we compartmentalized everything, we specialized, and we separated all these things into boxes because we can shift boxes around with machines, but computers, in theory, could actually let us uh, still maintain a modern structure without having to separate ourselves from who we are. 1985, Society of Mind, this is Papert's uh, partner in crime for uh, the 60s and 70s. And he was exploring the idea of artificial intelligence. Uh, one of the, a lot of robotics, artificial intelligence, and like his idea of artificial intelligence with complex interaction of agents. There's a lot here, but I'm going to kind of, kind of skim over Minsky and just say just this one quote from Society of Mind, which is a remarkable book. Uh, what magical trick makes this intelligent? The trick is that there is no trick. The power of intelligence stems from our vast diversity, not from any single perfect principle. It is, the idea is, is that, you know, that the, in the title, the, the title of the book, Society of Mind, is that our intelligence comes from the interaction of thousands of mindless agents, uh, which, you know, so you got your neurons and stuff, and, but he actually explored kind of how that would actually work. But this idea of complexity, uh, a beautiful complexity arising out of the simple interactions of things was one of the basic ideas uh, that Norbert Wiener really was uh, hammering in cybernetics and is one of the big popular things like with, uh, say, like Stephen Wolfram's uh, New Kind of Science, all these ideas of cellular automata, which was something that John von Neumann worked on, is one of the big ideas of today. 1985, Gnu Manifesto. That's right. We've uh, we've hit the age of the personal computing. Uh, there's Stallman. There he was working while Papert and Minsky were down, like on the fifth floor of uh, the AI lab building. Uh, he was up on the top floor uh, as a hacker there. And uh, in '85, after the essentially the a, uh, AI lab lost its culture, uh, essentially to uh, the world of uh, you know you could actually make money in computers, and so everybody left and did that. Uh, I mean, it's a more complicated story, but like, uh, he didn't want to give up uh, his kind of ideal life that he had, where he could just play and share uh, with computers. And he's founded the free software movement, which is at the same time a tele technological, moral, and political movement. Um, and the, but the great genius that he wasn't just starting the movement; it was it really was. And in the GNU Manifesto, we're really laying force the principle that the fundamental act of friendship among programmers is the sharing of programs. Marketing arrangements now typically used essentially forbid programmers to treat others as friends. So he wrote this document and laid down, kind of laid down the law on what it means to, you know, be a programmer to, you know, and like for what the, the, the society that he wanted to live in was. But his great work was 
doing, really was writing the GNU public license, which essentially had copyright by using uh, a system which was, is designed to control uh, access to knowledge and ideas and figure out what he, to use that control to essentially force it to be spread and shared. Um, and that's right there, that the, there's like you know, 50 speeches right there. Uh, but 1986, Engine of Creation, this is a Marvin Minsky disciple. Uh, K. R. Drexler, he's the man who essentially started the field of tech, nanotechnology um, and really tried to deal with his consequences. And uh, the idea of nanotechnology is that you have uh, small, uh, nano-sized, uh, like microscopic, uh, molecule-sized machines. And once you have that, uh, you can do pretty much anything, is kind of the idea. Assemblers will be able to make virtually anything from common materials without labor, replacing smoking factories with systems as clean as forests. They will transform technology and the economy at their roots, opening a new world of possibilities. And the Engines of Creation uh, discusses all these possibilities, both the kind of great and dangerous, and talks about like the responsibility. And the question is, is how, if we're, if technology is going to proceed in a, in a way that's going to transform our world, uh, like in every way, both uh, social and physical, how can we keep up? And we cannot do much to slow the growth of technology, but we can speed the growth of foresight. And with better foresight, we will have a better chance to steer the technology race in safe directions. And he believed that that way, he really believed uh, in Ted Nelson's message and Engelbart's message that the way that we can do that is by better uh, communication systems. He was a, like, this is 1986, and he really believed in the idea of hypertech systems uh, that would allow us to understand. And so the, this foment is leading up to the web, which was essentially invented in 1989 uh, by Tim Berners-Lee uh, with his paper, Information Management, a proposal. He originally was going to call it uh, something that the acronym would be Tim Moi, in other words, Tim Me, but he thought that was going to be a little too egocentric, so he gave it a less interesting title. Um, and like, it's pretty simple. It talks about, you've got your data overload, he's working at CERN, he's talking about there's all these, all these different forms of media, nobody's really communicating, why don't we just build a, a, a simple, straightforward hypertext system, and here, we're just going to zoom forward, here's the internet here, 1969, 4, boom, 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 1973, bigger, 1987, this is, so this is what you're dealing with now, is you're dealing with all these different networks all hooked up together, um, it's a great thing, but, you know, what to do with it? And so here's the worldwide web proposal, which, you know, he drew it on a Mac, so, and he used, uh, he used GNU software, he used uh, some of this, like, he used all the stuff that came beforehand, all the ideas, and, and just said, okay, well, you know, we'll just let's hack together uh, a hypertext system and give it away for free and make sure that everybody can use it. And it's, it's not fancy. Like Ted Nelson had a, a glorious vision for a, a beautiful and complex hypertext system uh, that was beautiful and complex. So like he, he compared, I think what was he compared to like the Xanadu, his system, to like the Queen Mary and uh, World Wide Web is like algae. But the thing is, is that algae is everywhere. And there's only like one Queen Mary. And like they get, when they hit icebergs, they sink. So this is what Tim Berners-Lee said about information management. We should work toward a universal linked information system in which generality and portability are more important than fancy graphic techniques and complex extra facilities. The aim would be to allow a place to be found for any information or reference which one felt was important and a way of finding it afterwards. And so he, you know, he, he knew what he was talking about because that's kind of the, the, both the good and the bad of the web is right there. Um, and then 1999, he wrote Weaving the Web, which kind of looked back at what had happened in the last 10 years, uh, going from the idea to what we have now. And this is one of the kind of his big central ideas, is that whether inspired by free market desires or humanistic ideals, we all felt control was the wrong perspective. The web's being out of control was very important. And like, you know, amen to that. Programming Pearl, Larry Wall, his great contribution 
he's the person who uh, invented the programming language Perl. But his great, uh, the, the real great contribution there is that it's a, it was a different way of looking at uh, uh, the idea of a programming language. And he he was a, a had been studied as a linguist, and his idea was let's design a language that's actually like kind of works the same way that human languages work. That it's messy. Um, there's lots of ways to do anything. There's no really, there's no perfect way of doing anything. There's more than one way to do it. Um, and then the thing, but the other recognition is that human languages come out and build and like are part of a culture. And he deliberately established a culture. He like was like, you know what? I want this language to be popular. I'm actually going to like come up with cute little catchphrases. I'm going to make this a cute and funny and popular thing. Um, and and with the exact same idea that Tim Berners-Lee had. If there's a germ of an important idea in pro culture, it's this, that too much control is just as deadly as too little control. We need control and we need chaos. And speaking of that, we have uh, 1997's uh, Eric S. Raymond's The Cathedral in the Bazaar, which perhaps most famously was the document which convinced Netscape to uh, open, go open source with his browser, which has finally actually gotten to be really nice. Um, and like you kind of codified open source and corporate terms, but the what the cathedral and bazaar talked about was you had a cathedral, which was the dominant way of creating software, which was that you had a, either a, kind of a proprietary closed business or also kind of you had your hacker priest. Like the cathedral does not just mean uh, commercial uh, proprietary things; it's also referring to uh, like. Uh, open source uh, systems in which you have like about you know five or ten people who do all the work and then kind of uh, open the doors and let people see their beautiful software. Whereas Linux was a bazaar. It was freewheeling, uh, like you know ended up having like tens, hundreds, you know, and now we have like a thousand contributors to the uh, to the kind of the, the whole all the, the, to the trunk. Um, and th that was like the really kind of the amazing thing there. And is that it, it may be that one of the most important effects of open source success will be to teach us that play is the most economically efficient mode of creative work. And this is, that's the exact same idea that uh, Abby Hoffman was uh, harping about uh, on the streets of New York, uh, you know, in the 60s. And it's a kind of a funny thing that uh, with computers, it, the kind of the, radical 60s, in some sense, actually may come to fruition. Uh, and here we go to where we're going to end here, which is with the Future Ideas, which is a, you know, a great title. And uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, a lawyer, a, uh, a constitutional scholar, uh, you know, he clerked uh, under Scalia in uh, the Supreme Court, and essentially a superstar uh, law kid. And he did, with the Microsoft trial, he um, essentially became interested in uh, the world of computers and has studied it and basically got very depressed about what's happening uh, because he's like, look, it's, we, we, we're, making, we're making choices that's going to affect us for generations, like the, whether we have a, essentially a democratic society or not, um, and we're making all the wrong choices. And he just says, this is kind of the central idea of future ideas, which is a remarkable book. His first book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, is also a very good book. Um, but this is it's, it's great stuff. And it says, free resources have been crucial to innovation and creativity. Without them, creativity is crippled. Especially in the digital age, the central question becomes not whether government or the market should control a resource, but whether a resource should be controlled at all. And I guess that's where this talk ends. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, we'd love to discuss them. Thanks. Oh, and we've got, oh, oh, we've got, and we have like, I think, two minutes. So you can either raise your hand and come up to the mic or uh, sit, I suppose.
quote on it, I think it's trying to turn that I found it interesting when you quoted the person who uh, said that you know the child mind was better to simulate that it could grow into the adult mind. Right. I think now with stem cell research, wouldn't it be cool if you could just simulate just a stem cell and then have that grow into a child's mind? Well, I mean, the idea of like you know the whole idea of neural networks as like a avenue for artificial intelligence is one of those early ones and has gone over the place. But you know. Like it's kind of like going from physics to chemistry in theory, you know, or physics to biology. Like in theory, all you have to know to understand a human mind is like, you know, in the laws of physics. Um, but it's so far removed that like, uh, you, it's you know, it's it's one of those things. People try it, and it would be, be, and I wouldn't be surprised if people are actually going to try to like grow physical forms, physical brains, and see what happens. But you know, one of the nice things about computers is that you can. You know, do your imaginary thing, and you can run through like you know fifty thousand generations of an idea. Uh, except that when you're talking about like a brain with many trillions of cells, like that's it ends up being an amazing amount of computing power. But part of the idea of like nanotechnology, for example, is that the the line between what we consider computing and what we consider uh, like say physical, like uh, biology, or like those things will get blurred. Like. When you design a, you know, when you design software, you can, you know, have it come out as DNA, in theory, or go slip in between the two, um, and so that's one of those interesting things that'll be happening. Yeah. He's talking about the uh, the ecology of computing, the idea that like when computers uh, kind of become essentially pervasive, that you can actually you it'll, it'll almost become a biological science. Yeah, I mean, and it, yeah, it's I mean, one thing that we're finding is is that like these traditional sciences like uh, you know biology and chemistry, physics, that are traditionally like very distinct. Like I mean, like. In some sense, biology is where it's at these days, like uh, because biology is, you know, becoming a real science in some sense now. I mean, some people might argue that it's been a real science for a while, but you know. I think it's. We should probably, uh, yeah, call it. We got the red card, so this is it. Thank you very much.